Hello, friends. I would like to talk to you today about a technology that I've been working on for the past several years. Radio frequency fingerprinting with polarization mode dispersion. It's a very exciting technology that I believe has a potential to disrupt the way we do cybersecurity for wireless IoT. It's very interesting technology. I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing a little bit about it. You know, we get a lot of news through our news feeds about consumers adopting wireless IoT technology in their homes, controlling devices and monitoring. Well, what we don't read about as often is that industry is doing the same thing. And it makes perfect sense because wireless devices are so much less expensive to install than wired. So if we can distribute sensors and monitors around the plant, we can get information real time on our processes that help us improve efficiency and thus the bottom line. So many are getting on board with wireless technologies, as you can see from these examples, like refineries and steel plants and chemical plants, but also pharmaceuticals and many other manufacturing operations. In fact, Industry 4.0 is an overarching development process that describes this entire area. There's only one problem and that is that as you introduce new wireless technology, each of those wireless devices could potentially become an entry point into the network for an attacker. So we want to be very careful about the security process centered around adopting wireless technology. If you take a look at the entire state of cybersecurity as I did a few years ago, I actually came from an industrial control background rather than cybersecurity. So uh, I've been learning about cybersecurity for the past four years. And I've noticed one thing, every time an attack takes place, and here are some of those attacks that are most well known, we come up with a solution. It's usually a software solution. It gets downloaded and distributed in new equipment, sometimes in old equipment, not always. And then a new attacker comes along and we install another software solution. But with every installation of software, as you can imagine, also comes vulnerability. So we introduce new vulner vulnerabilities that are taken advantage of and often create new attack vectors. Our solution, write more software and install it. This is not a good pattern. It ends up in a game of chasing the perpetrator. That means every time a perpetrator comes up with a new attack vector, we try to go and fix it behind them. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get out in front of the perpetrator and just stop the attack in the first place? That would be uh, one ideal method that we should strive for in cybersecurity. The other thing that's happening in the cyberspace is that it's becoming very complex because the solutions are so divergent. So with that complexity, comes extra knowledge needed by a control systems engineer. And soon it becomes overwhelming where the control systems engineer is relying on their vendors rather than taking charge of the individual fixes themselves. So they create sole sourcing to cover all of the aspects of security in their plant. Well, when something goes wrong, 
Do you fix it yourself or do you turn to the vendor? You have to decide in each case whether the problem could have stemmed from the security system or is it the control system? It becomes a very complicated issue to decouple. And then there's innovation fatigue. This is what we call so many different solutions being uh, introduced into the marketplace under so many different names. There's over hundreds and hundreds of companies now in the cyberspace. It's getting hard to even sort them out and categorize them, much less decide which ones you need in your particular case to protect your plant. There's really too many solutions. In fact, there's companies now who try to do that for you. So they're in between the vendor and the control systems engineer. This all leads to very complicated compliance testing. It creates problem solving difficulties as well. When something goes wrong, how do you find what's responsible? And combining products from various companies can often lead to unintended consequences. So you can actually create problems for yourself beyond the control system problems. Really, what we would prefer to have is something that's simple, a simple solution that doesn't interfere with the control mechanisms whatsoever or other security measures. And one last thing, this is a big one. Attackers don't attack the new equipment that you just installed. They attack the weakest point in your plant. That's the oldest equipment probably and it's probably the PLC that's running in the background with old software and old technology. Almost no one in the cybersecurity space coming up with new solutions is looking backward to try to protect the old devices. They assume that you're going to replace them with new devices, but that's impractical. You can't replace 30 million devices in industrial plants that are already installed. It would be too costly. So what do we do with the legacy devices, the 30 million of them that are already installed in industrial plants? Well, today I would say that because no one is facing backwards as well as forwards, then we're only addressing a very small percentage of the market, which is the new devices, the new devices. We really need something that is much more fundamental. It's simple and it can be installed to protect legacy devices. Why? Why bother? Maybe we should just go on without securing the old devices and move forward with what cybersecurity just comes with the product and not worry about this. Well, I'll tell you, friends, cybersecurity is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Just within the last year, I have noticed that attacks are becoming far more sophisticated than they have in the past, and they're becoming state-backed meaning there's money behind them. Now, rather than doing a denial of service attack that shuts your plant down immediately, perpetrators are attacking quality assurance. Just six weeks ago in Florida, a water plant was attacked. What did the attacker do? They adjusted a toxic chemical to be 100 times stronger entering the water supply system than uh, specified. 
So they changed a set point in the process just to poison the water, basically, without the plant operator knowing. Fortunately, the plant operator happened to be sitting at the terminal at the time of the attack and noticed the mouse cursor moving. So they knew to go look and they found the change in the setting and set it back before any damage was done. But that shows you just how sophisticated the attackers are becoming. If they can go into quality assurance, change the a process, they can affect pharmaceuticals with deadly consequences and water supply. They can also still cause the plant shutdown, which for oil and gas industry costs millions in just a very short period of time. And worse, they could cause potential employee injury. Uh, this photo is actually of a particular attack, uh, the result of an attack on a plant uh, that was a cyber attack. So the consequences can be grave if you ignore cybersecurity, but it's so complicated, what are we going to do? So thinking aloud now and creating our wish list, we would really like to see a solution that prevents the intrusion instead of reacting to it. It's simple to implement and is backward compatible. And I'm going to add, as long as we're wishing here, let's add to our wish list. Wouldn't it be nice if whatever cybersecurity method we used was also protocol agnostic? So we could use it with any particular technology, whether it be Zigbee, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Z-Wave, or any other technology used in wireless sensors. And what if that same technology could take us to the highest level of security that our plant could have? Well, wait a second, what do you mean by highest level of security? Great question. Well, the cybersecurity maturity model, which is part of a certification process, identifies five levels of security, the fifth level being the highest. And the fifth level is enunciated by identifying and mitigating risk associated with unidentified wireless access points connected to the network. It's one of the hardest problems for a cybersecurity professional to attack. So let's put that on our wish list that we would like to identify and mitigate risk associated with unidentified wireless devices. And let's add to that. So by being the highest level of security, let's also look at the IEC 62443, which is a requirement that has four levels uh, four security levels identified, the fourth of which is demarked with multi-factor authentication for all interfaces. If we had something that acted like multi-factor authentication, machine to machine, so between the, the sensor and the network, it could use something that was similar to multi-factor authentication, then we'd have something that was strong. So the solution that we're working on at Endpoint and that I'm presenting here today, I think will address these points. I'll let you be the judge as you see how we do this in the rest of this presentation. At a, at a 30, 
thousand foot level, what we are doing is recognizing a fingerprint in every wireless signal. So we can use the signal itself to decide whether that device is authenticated or not and allow it to communicate or block it. Pretty simple in theory, pretty hard to do technically. In fact, we originally thought we would have to introduce some uh, a new chipset that we would uh, put in to an access point. You see, the fingerprint is natural. We don't have to touch the edge device. So all we have to do is change the software in the um, access point. And we thought we might need a chipset to do that. But as it turns out, the FPGAs in today's um, wireless access points have plenty enough room to do what we're trying to do. So it probably will be uh, more of a, a software change than a, a hardware change, which is a nice thing, makes it a little easier for the manufacturer. Before I describe the technology to you, let me show you how it is it intended to work. The chart at the very top is what the access point containing the technology would look like. It sees various kinds of signals arriving, short pulses, long pulses. Let's say we have a camera in our process that is uh, monitoring the plant and sending wirelessly signals back to the access point. It might look something like the longer signals at the top. You see actually in the longer signals that there's two that have very low intensity preceding each of the two that has a high intensity. So are these all the same device? Are they different devices? Well, in the center, we see the fingerprints that are created from the RF signals. The fingerprints clearly show that there are three devices communicating here. The ones in the upper left of the sphere and the upper right of the sphere, the gray and the blue, are authenticated. That means someone an, an operator, an administrator, has marked those previously as devices that are allowed access to the network. But then there's the purple one, which is a third device, which we mark as rogue. This is an unauthorized device trying to gain access to the network, but being disallowed. These are what the fingerprints look like and what the process would entail. So let's dive a little bit more deeply into the technology. It was born out of radar technology done at the University of Notre Dame under several contracts with the Navy. Some of the ideas that were used in this radar research could also apply to any electromagnetic signal, including the RF signals that we look for in industrial control systems. So here's an actual screenshot from a test that we performed recently. There are eight devices communicating here. You could clearly see them and see their fingerprints colored uh, to identify each individual device. In this particular case, we overlay 200 signals 
one on top of the other. So we can see how the fingerprints vary from time to time. And we also turned off the smoothing function. So instead of the nice smooth lines that you saw in the previous slide, here you see what we call caterpillars. They really contain all of the information, including the noise that's uh, recorded along with the signal. And you can see from this that it, even over 200 signals, it's still very easy to identify individually each of the devices that are communicating. Now, the interesting thing about this test was that all eight of these devices were the same device. They're the same make and model of, of device sending the same information all in a room that was about 10 by 20 feet. Very small. Small room, eight devices, all the same, and yet they can be distinguished quite easily by their fingerprints. This is done through polarization, polarization of a signal. So let's step back and remind ourselves of how an RF device sends a polarized signal. Well, it is tied to the type of antenna that the device is using to send a signal. When a device sends a signal, there is an electronic, uh, electric signal rather, uh, sinusoidal in, in this particular case, uh, shown for simplicity. And you can see in the black that it is sending a vertically aligned sinusoid, the E field. It also has a corresponding H field, which is the magnetic field, which is 90 degrees separated from it. In the rest of this presentation, we will only be concerned with the electric field. So this chart in, in, our, in the rest of our discussion is a purely vertically aligned transmitter. Now we can use this kind of information to help us create a signature. Well, it wouldn't be very interesting if the receiver only received the vertical signal. But as it turns out, because of the multipath, the path that the signal takes on its way from the transmitter to the receiver, it bounces off of many objects, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, equipment, chairs, people. It bounces off of many things on its way to the receiver. And each time it does, it twists the polarization. So this makes it very interesting because any fixed device in one particular location sending to a fixed receiver will carry a perfect signature. It might even twist in a way that it's not perfectly linear. In other words, it may create a polarization that actually rotates. In this case, we can see either right hand or left hand circular polarization. Now polarization, when it twists like that, doesn't behave the same way in the vertical axis as it does in the horizontal axis. In fact, the horizontal axis can be delayed in time over the vertical axis. This is usually seen as an impairment in uh, the multi-channel path. It's due, due to, I, sh I should say, the multi-panel path. This is uh, taken from a lecture on that subject. Uh, and from here, you can see that an impulse arriving or, or being sent from a transmitter 
and arriving at a receiver can have a component in a different direction, vertical versus horizontal, for instance, that is time delayed. So it actually affects the following sample uh, with information that shouldn't theoretically be there. As a result, you can see that the rather than the received signal being a nice square wave showing zeros and ones, it became it becomes a spread. And this is an undesirable uh, feature if you're trying to get data out of it. But since it exists, we can also use it. And what we have found is that this becomes a useful piece of information in determining a fingerprint for a device. We plot polarization on a Poincaré sphere. A Poincaré sphere is a coordinate system that's on a sphere. And the, with the vertical and horizontal axes representing the uh, equator of the sphere. Here I show vertical and horizontal on either side, but they're actually 90 degrees separated, as you know. Uh, it's just hard to see the V if it's on top of the sphere, so I placed it on the other side just to remind us that the equator is a vertical and horizontal plane. So what are the poles then? Well, the poles are right-hand and left-hand circular polarization. So the red dot at the top of the sphere represents a transmitter sending a signal that is purely right-hand circular polarized. Now that's not what the receiver sees though, because the, the signal bounces off of things in the multipath on its way to the receiver. And as a result, the angle of polarization is changed. So the receiver will see that polarization as something different than it, it was originally sent. This is useful information for us. But even more useful is the fact that that polarization is frequency dependent. And since we send information over an existing bandwidth, each frequency in that bandwidth has a different impact based on the twisting of the polarization on its way to the receiver. So rather than a dot, we get a line made up of dots for each frequency that are contained in the bandwidth. This is what we call a fingerprint. Now, of course, we don't send information at a single frequency. Everything, even narrow band signals, like this Bluetooth signal, has a bandwidth. And as you can see marked in the yellow, some of the bands, subbands in this uh, particular signal will have different characteristics in polarization mode dispersion than the main signal. So this particular case, we're looking at something that was sent in uh, channel 36 of a 5G network. And uh, as you can see from the sim simple example, the yellow represents one of the subbands of the bandwidth of a very narrow pulse, probably a Bluetooth signal, as I mentioned. And the reason I say that is because this is the actual recording of a Bluetooth signal, and it looks very much like that. So this is, this is precisely what a narrow band signal looks like. Wide band signals even have more polarization mode dispersion. So they have longer fingerprints, as you can imagine. And here is a Wi-Fi signal, which has a very broad 
bandwidth. This is a chart that's 20 megahertz wide. The, uh, the vertical axis is uh, just a unitized intensity received by the uh, receiver at the antenna. So it goes from zero to one. And uh, the horizontal axis is actually frequency bins. So we're moving from the time domain now to the frequency domain. So rather than looking over a period of time, we're looking over a period of 20 megahertz. And the uh, one through, uh, looks like about uh, 2000, if I move out of the way, <laughs> um, that, uh, that represents 2000 frequency bins in that 20 megahertz. Uh, bandwidth. So this signal is very interesting to us because it represents a very common one, a Wi-Fi signal, and uh, it has certain characteristics. One is it's made up of a main lobe and side lobes. The side lobes actually aren't real. They, they stem from the fact that it's a digital Fourier transform. And that basically when you take uh, a signal and uh, put it through a transform, you choose a period of time that is assumed to be a full cycle of a particular signal of interest. In our case, it probably isn't going to be a full cycle. In fact, this, many of the frequencies are added together to make the signal that we uh, are sending. So as a result, some of them are cut off uh, before the full cycle. The end result on the other side of the math equation are these side lobes. So we would really uh, like to eliminate these side lobes. And, and so to use the technique that we're describing here, to get a better result, you can just use the main lobe. Now in this particular case, the main lobe has a dip right in the center. That is a function of the uh, Barker code that is used in uh, Wi-Fi and in, in OFDM, which this signal happened to be, uh, which has a nulling uh, design. So uh, the, you, you see a dip rather than a peak at the center that you might expect. So it becomes a little bit tricky to find the uh, main lobe. And as you get down, in the signal levels where the signals are low SNR, like this particular one. I think this one uh, actually, we just ran this last week. And I think it was actually a 10 dB signal. So I'm being very generous by, by saying it's 15 to 25 here. But when you start getting uh, low signals like this, you get bit error rates. So uh, what we would like to do is be able to still get the fingerprint even as the communication begins to fail. And so this is how we trim a low SNR signal and the result. If you'd like to see the way that we do this, there's a paper uh, that is being presented which uh, describes this particular uh, mechanism. And you're welcome to uh, go see the paper to see how that is done. Here's a couple of other cases. The signal may not be centered on the same center frequency as the receiver. So if you have adjacent channels with signals arriving, you still need to be able to decide uh, whether or not they belong to a particular device. And uh, so we operate the same sort of main lobe uh, 
recognition process here. On the one on the right, you see that the main lobe is actually cut in half. Uh, we're only seeing a portion of the main lobe, but that doesn't make any difference when you're trying to determine the angle at which the uh, signal arrives. So the polarization part of that works pretty well. So the end result, here's one device with a uh, signature or a fingerprint on the Poincare sphere. It's on the surface of the sphere and makes a U at the very top of the sphere. This is close to the right-hand circular point, as you recall. So we can assume that this signal is mostly right-hand circular and it varies as to uh, where that is in the horizontal and, and vertical uh, positions. Here's another one. It's off to the side and goes down closer to the equator. Uh, so you can see that there are components of uh, the uh, vertical or horizontal uh, in this particular device. Here's a third that actually folds back on itself. Uh, we don't know uh, what the shape of the curve is going to be and they can just turn around and, and uh, fold uh, on themselves as well. Doesn't matter as far as we're concerned uh, because uh, we are only interested that it is unique. So how well do they track then? This is a uh, chart that shows two devices communicating. The blue device is Bluetooth and the uh, maroon or purple uh, device on the right is Wi-Fi. So we're looking at two different technologies here and we're overlaying signals one on top of the other. It looks like the blue one probably had about five uh, signals overlaid and the um, maroon about uh, 20 signals overlaid, one on top of the other. And you can see that they trace across uh, each other pretty well. We use that feature uh, to identify that particular device. Remember the length of the uh, curve moves from one end of the bandwidth to the other. The fuzziness at the end of the uh, maroon um, curve here is probably due to the fact that uh, we picked up a side lobe. That's the effect that we see uh, from, from those side lobes that we would like to eliminate. It doesn't really matter uh, as far as being able to recognize it as a device, but it doesn't look very good. Here's a shot of eight devices uh, that, uh, again, these are all um, the uh, same uh, type of device as well. And you can see that they can be uh, sorted apart from one another, each one color coded for its own particular device. And at the very top, I, I don't know, uh, let's see if I can point in the right direction. <laughs> at the very top of the sphere, you can see a green uh, pulse that uh, often gets missed because of the green shading of the sphere. Uh, here's a different angle and a different test uh, using eight devices as well. In this one, it looks like a, a Bluetooth device over in the very right-hand side in black popped up. That is probably because I forgot to turn off my uh, watch before the test. <laughs> which I often do. <laughs> and then we get the Bluetooth signal from it. Um, here's yet another, uh, and you can clearly see that these devices can be uh, derived from one another using polarization mode dispersion. So this is great news. But we get often get asked a certain question. If this is based 
on the multipath between sending device and receiving device, what if somebody walks through the, the building, the plant? Well, this is what happens. This is uh, someone walking through, uh, uh, moving in the, in the multipath. But practically, anyone walking through the multipath covers only a very small portion of uh, what is the, the, the true channel. So they're, they're only walking through a very small portion of the entire multipath where signals are bouncing off of walls and floors and ceilings. So the, the impact is not great, but we can see it. Um, and in this particular case, it actually moved the curve in one dimension. Uh, but as you can also see, because it's the same color, we did not lose the fact that that fingerprint belonged to a single device. So I know that's a lot of technical information to absorb. Let's take a look at a use case to bring it all home. So the technology is good for wireless IoT devices that are fixed in place. Those are things like your thermostat, your doorbell, um, washing machine, and so forth. But in industry, you see a lot of these uh, IoT devices. They are used as sensors, monitors, cameras, and actuators throughout the plant. Often they can be put in in the, in the thousands. So let's say you install a temperature sensor in your plant. And that temperature sensor communicates with an access point by sending temperature information on a periodic basis. Well, it's a potential entry point into the network as well because it is communicating with the access point. So we want to be protective of even the temperature sensor, not so much the data, but the fact that it can be an entry point. So as it sends data to the access point, it bounces off of equipment, pipes, and ceilings and floors and so forth on its way there. And it creates a very nice polarization mode fingerprint which you can see on the left of this diagram. So when a hacker comes along, even if they have the password, the MAC address, and the IP address for that temperature sensor, we recognize them as a separate sending device and can easily disallow their access to the network. This is a fundamental change in the way we do cybersecurity in wireless devices. It's a fingerprinting technology that exists only in the access point. So we never have to touch any of the edge devices and we're fully backward compatible with anything that sends an electromagnetic signal wirelessly. So by fundamental, I mean that fingerprinting an RF signal gives you these kinds of advantages. If you can imagine, no encryption is needed, but it works very nicely with encryption if you decide to keep encryption. No security keys are passed. The fingerprint is never passed. It's kept inside the access point. Simplified authentication methods are employed. We don't use the network protocol layer at all. It's all done on the physical layer. It's backward compatible with old devices, which almost no uh, cybersecurity methods are. Uh, it's zero day threat protection because anything new that comes along is usually done digitally, not in analog. 
we can detect rogue access points and prevent their access to the network. There's no need to modify any of the endpoints. And sometimes I'll tell you, in our experience, in some of the industrial plants, it's even hard to find some of those endpoints. It's protocol agnostic, so we can work as easily with Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, uh, wi uh, wireless heart, any, any type of protocol. And it's near zero touch onboarding. Of course, there is an authentication process. So you uh, do have only that portion, but the rest is just changing out an access point and then you're finished. So this is an introduction to a technology that I think may have some interest for you. It's one that we believe will uh, revolutionize the way we do uh, cybersecurity in wireless devices. And I would be glad to interface with you and answer any further questions that you may have or talk to you further about it at any of the uh, contact points listed above. I appreciate your attendance and uh, following this uh, lecture all the way through. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoyed the conference.